as George referenced the other day, your culture is the way you behave. So, first of all, I want you to realize that your culture is co-created. Your culture is the product of your behavior, your personality, your values, the behavior, personality, values of the other coaches, and then the behavior, the values of your players and their personalities. So how do you think you can create a culture that gets good results? Think about some things you've learned this week and what George had to teach us over the past few days. So what are some things you can do to create a healthy culture of performance? Okay, communicate clearly. About what? What do you want to communicate about? I agree. Sorry? Okay, be very clear on what the goals are. What does success look like? Great, very good. What else? What did we say is the foundation of a high-performing team? Somebody said it over here. Trust, exactly. Trust. So we're going to talk about how we can build some trust. What, what else do we want to communicate and be very clear about? Setting goals? Oh, the rules. Okay, very good. Okay, so these are the behaviors that we expect to see. Very good. Great. Can you think of anything else that you might want to communicate clearly? Okay, very good. We'll, we'll continue to talk about that. But look at this right here. Allow. If you are the, the leader, the coach, you are responsible for the culture of your team. Your team's behavior is a direct reflection of your leadership. In other words, you as the leader are ridiculously in charge. You are absolutely, totally in charge, whether you feel like it or not. So we're not going to, it's not necessarily an authoritarian statement where you get to wield your authority over those that you lead. It's merely a reflection of the reality that it is your team. Now, we talked about rules. You can think of rules as boundaries. This is what you're allowed to do. This is not, this is what you're allowed to not do. Boundaries allow you to focus your energy on the things that are most important and are going to bring you success. 
and they limit distractions. We're doing this. We're not doing this. This is how we behave. This is how we treat each other. This is how we treat other people. This is not what we do. This is not how we treat other people. Those are boundaries. So remember, good boundaries always create freedom. Not control. So while as the leader you are ridiculously in charge, leadership is not about control. Great leaders create an environment of freedom within these boundaries. Are we good? Good. All right. Now, this is something we've talked a lot about because it's that important. It's the foundation of every great team. And what we've learned from George is that our brains want us to be safe, which means we need to trust. Trust is safety. So the question that, as a leader, you want to answer for your players and for your team is, do my teammates feel safe? Do they trust me as a coach? Do they trust each other? What happens if there's a lack of trust? Up here, what happens in our brains? Right. We feel threatened. And we get what's called an amygdala hijack. <laughs> your, your, your reptilian brain, your crocodile brain takes over. You start thinking like a crocodile. Things usually do not go well when we're thinking like a crocodile. Our brains are flooded with the cortisol. We do not perform effectively and efficiently. So what behaviors do you see when people do not feel safe? Okay, so they become internal and self-focused. Maybe they stop communicating. They isolate themselves. Isolate, okay. Good, what else? People don't feel safe. Okay, sure. They, they remove themselves from the threat. They withdraw. Good, good. What else? Yeah, some of the boundaries or rules that you set up, you see someone kind of acting out. Maybe they break rules or they Sure. They start breaking the rules. You see unhealthy conflict. Conflict that's focused on personality. 
The lack of unity, yes. More conflict? Yeah, more conflict. What about when they do feel trust, when they do feel safe? What do you see then? All the decision is be, to be wrong. Uh, what's that? All the decision yeah. is wrong. Their decisions are wrong. Yeah. If they feel safe? Yeah. No. no, if they don't feel safe. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, very good. Yeah. Yeah, they, they start making mistakes. They're not thinking clearly. But if, if they do feel safe, if they do feel safe, then what do we see? Okay, team chemistry. Okay, we see healthy relationships. Esprit de corps. Great decision. Better decision making, because they're thinking clearly, not like a crocodile. <laughs> yes. Oh, only that. Only that crocodiles have a very simple brain. They like just have an amygdala, very reactionary. This is called a reptilian brain. That's the smallest part of our brain, internal. And then we have our prefrontal cortex. Our brains are much more highly developed. So it's just a comparison between an undeveloped brain and a higher thinking, processing brain. Rept reptilian brains are the simplest brains. Our brains are the highest order brains, and you've got primates and mammals, crocodiles and other reptiles. They have only one or all? Oh, just one. Yeah, one amygdala. Same with us, but we've got all the other stuff around it. So the crocodile is very simple. They just want to kill stuff. We don't want our players just wanting to kill things. And when people feel safe, we talked about this the other day, they're able to engage in healthy conflict. So that's conflict about ideas, concepts, strategy, not personal attacks. So how can you know if someone feels safe or not? Okay, you can you can observe their behavior. Just by watching their actions. Okay. But nonverbal communication is kind of ambiguous. It's unclear. So if you want to know if somebody feels safe or not, how can you know? Watch their eyes. OK. What might you see? OK. All right. OK. So maybe they're tired. Maybe they feel unsafe. Again, how can we bring clarity to whether or not people feel safe? I think you're right, though. Ask them. If they lie, that's not your responsibility. Just ask people, do you feel safe? Just ask them. How safe do you feel? Do you trust your teammates? Do you trust me as your coach? So you'll see on this pyramid here, accountability 
is essential if you want to get results. So we have to hold people accountable. But it's only possible when we first have commitment. Right here. If people are not committed, it's very difficult to hold them accountable for their behavior. They can simply say, well, I never agreed to do that. I never thought that was a good idea. But the only way you get to that commitment, as we talked about the other day, is through healthy conflict. <laughs> People want to and need to be heard. They want to be and need to be part of the solution. And trust, though, is the fertile ground of conflict, healthy conflict. So your accountability and your team's performance is rooted in the level of trust the level of safety that the people on the team feel. <laughs> as a leader, you need to overcome what we in the United States might refer to as the wuss factor. A wuss is someone who is weak, is afraid of conflict and confrontation. So we need to develop the character structure and the skills that allow us the, the courage to confront someone about their deficiencies and deal with the reaction. <laughs> Wuss. Someone who is weak. Someone, someone who is weak. Afraid of, of confrontation. A lot of times, really, it means as leaders, we need to trust ourselves. We need to feel safe and comfortable in who we are in our skills as a leader. I want to also suggest that to hold someone accountable really is an act of love. Have you, have you ever had food caught in one of your teeth? Yeah. And, and then someone says to you, oh, hey, you've got, you've got something on your tooth here. You appreciate that. That, that communicates that they're for you, and they're not afraid to tell you that Oh, you got something on your tooth, or there's something on your cheek. In a very similar way, as we let people know that there are behaviors that are working against them, that's not easy to hear, but we have to love them enough to take that emotional risk to let them know that your behavior is counterproductive, it's not helping our team. Okay, so here's some, ta here's some things that we can talk about on how to build trust.
I think the bottom line, what trust is all about is vulnerability. It's transparency that builds trust. That's Roger Swartz, the author of Smart Leaders, Smarter Teams. Vulnerability. So I want to talk to you about a concept I learned called the five safeties. And then we'll talk about how people grow. But vulnerability is self-disclosure. Telling people about what's inside of your heart. Do you know, think about, your, think about the people that you coach. Think about your teammates. Do you know what their dreams are? Do you know what, how they conceive their identity? Who they are? What is bringing them the greatest joy in their life? What is causing pain in their life? What are some of their greatest and favorite memories? What are some of their most painful <laughs> memories? Those events shaped who they are today. They're shaping who they're going to become. It's that knowing each other that pulls people together. That vulnerability. At any given moment, people exist in one of three zones. Your, your coaches, your players, are always in one of these three zones. In the middle, we have the comfort zone. I feel and perceive no threats. It's a very easy place to be. When I imagine this, I imagine sitting home on the couch eating potato chips. No threats. Everything is safe. Next we have the growth zone. This is where we're being stretched. We're taken out of our comfort zone. We're learning something new. So for you to come to the United States gets you out of your comfort zone. You're now in an unfamiliar place. There's a part of you that wants to go back to your comfort zone and will, but you feel safe enough to stay in the growth zone. This is very important because the growth zone is where learning takes place. No learning takes place in the comfort zone. No learning takes place in the comfort zone. 
Learning takes place in the growth zone. After the growth zone, we have the panic zone. No learning takes place in the panic zone. This is where people are very, very afraid. <laughs> now people progress from the comfort zone into the growth zone. And they progress from the growth zone to the panic zone. When they get to the panic zone, they don't go back to the growth zone. They go back to the comfort zone. So as a leader, you want to very carefully manage and be aware of where people are on your team. Are they in the growth zone? Are they in the comfort zone? Are they in the panic zone? This is why we practice, practice, practice. So that in a game, players trust each other, and they also trust themselves. They also know how to react when things don't go well. You don't want your players to, to freeze up if they miss a shot. Sorry? I missed that statement. Are you able to repeat it? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. The last statement? Yes. I missed it. Are you able to repeat the statement? Uh, yeah, which, which one? You, you want to... Yeah, they, they go directly to the comfort zone. They don't go to the growth zone. They just go right to their comfort zone. And no, all learning stops. So let's say you're in a game and somebody turns over the basketball. You don't want them to panic. Which is why you practice. What do you do when the ball is stolen? How do you get it back? How do you stay present not go into fight or flight mode. So, if your players know that their teammates aren't going to turn on them when they make a mistake, it creates a safer environment. They don't have to worry about your reaction or the player's reaction. They can stay present and respond to the situation. So, right now, in this room, you are in one of three zones. You're in your comfort zone, your growth zone, or your panic zone. My hope is that you are in your growth zone. You're learning. You're not panicked. You're not checking out because you can't understand the language. You're getting behind. Your stomach's upset. You're cold. Yeah. 
What should you do if you're in the panic zone, personally? Great question. So if you're in your panic zone, you're getting emotionally hijacked. Your fight or, your flight or, uh, fight or flight response is taking over. So a lot of this gets back to what George taught us about mindfulness. Be aware that you're getting emotionally hijacked. Take some deep breaths. Calm yourself down. This is the secret to high performing athletes. They find a way to calm themselves down. Most of this research began with tennis players. You'll notice that tennis players are at maximum exertion for a very short amount of time. Exertion, output, energy. They are totally amped up during the play. So you'll see a tennis player stand at the line, bounce the ball two or three times. Then they'll stop, do it again. Now they're on until the point is won. Throw the ball serve and it's on they are totally maxed out until that point is over their body is flooded with adrenaline and they're very close to getting into that amygdala hijack because of all of the hormones that are coursing through their body and so what they need to do when the point is over, whether they win or lose, they put it behind them. And they go through the exact same routine again. Boom, boom, boom. Take a breath. Boom, boom, boom. Take a breath. They calm themselves down. When they, when they understand, when they feel they are calmed down, then it's time to execute again. And it's on. So the trick is to create a system where you can calm yourself down when things don't go according to plan. That is the reason why some players, when they face a pressure defense, they'll turn it over. Yeah. And that player, some players need to come out the game right. and watch it. It's their comfort zone. Right. But then there are some players that'll turn it over when the trap comes. Yeah. And they can regain their composure on the court. Right. And play through it the next time. Right. Right. Yeah, that's it exactly. Yeah. So teaching your players about mindfulness, teaching them to calm themselves down, when they turn the ball over, when they brick the ball, is critical to keeping your team in this, in this growth zone, in this maximum performance zone, in that state of flow that George talked about. So here's how you can check in. We talked about asking people why they're not safe or whether or not they're safe. You could just check in with your hand. Super simple. Your pinky, your small finger here, the weakest, most vulnerable finger, represents physical safety. If people perceive a physical threat, they are not going to perform well, if at all. Next, 
Your ring finger. All right? This represents relational safety. In the United States, it's the left hand. In other countries, it's the right hand, where you put your wedding ring. Relational safety. If things don't go well, I know that my teammates, my coach, are not going to turn on me. Our friendship is safe. I told you about the Boston Red Sox pitcher, Eovaldi, who gave up the winning uh, home run to the other team. All of his players accepted him. They hugged him. They thanked him for how well he pitched, even though they lost the game. That's the type of safety that you want to create on your team, that relational safety. Next, your middle finger. Respect, right? Respect. It's a sign of incredible disrespect, but you want people to be respected. So check in and find out. Do you know that we respect you? If you send a guy in to make the game-winning shot and he misses it, he wants to know, are you still going to respect me? Yeah, we still respect you. So this deals a lot with the emotional safety that, that George was teaching us about. Relational and respect. And then your index finger your, or pointer finger is directional safety. Are we clear on the goals? Are we clear on the rules? Do we, do we understand the play? The way we're supposed to execute things? Are my teammates competent? That all refers to directional safety. And then if they're safe, in the United States we give a thumbs up. I'm safe. Thumbs down, I'm not safe. So if you're in a team meeting, it's a simple way to check in with your team. Guys, how are we doing? Does everybody feel safe? Everybody can give you a thumbs up. If somebody gives you a thumbs down, check in. What's the problem? Is it physical, relational, respect, direction? I'm unclear what the play is. This other guy that I'm up against is massive. I'm afraid he's going to crush me. <laughs> so a very simple way to check in with your team to find out if they are feeling safe, if they're in their growth zone. Now, as a leader, I said you want to keep people in the growth zone. You want them to accept risk. You want them to be able to grow. What we want to do is create basically safety lines. Have you ever been rappelling off a cliff, rock climbing? When you, I've done this, and I can tell you that it's stupid. You back up to a cliff, and then you start leaning backwards. And you know you're about to pass the point of no return where you're just going to fall. But the reason you do something so stupid is because there's a line that's anchored in the ground. And you're in a harness. So you start walking 
backwards off a cliff even though you would die. That's a safety line. And what you want to do is create those safety lines for your team. <clears throat> we talked earlier about boundaries, behaviors. Those behaviors are a function of your team's values. These are the behaviors that we allow and that we expect. I like to refer to values as the rules of engagement. <clears throat> the behavior that we expect from each other as teammates, as peers, but also the behavior that we expect to demonstrate to our clients, our opponents. Here's some examples of some values. Faith. Family. Focus. Finish. These are the values of a football team here in Ohio. Now, as George talked about the other day, we need to be very clear about what these words mean. What does faith look like? What does family look like? What does it mean that we as a team treat each other like a family? What does focus look like? What does finish look like? The more clarity, the more agreement we have on our values, the stronger the trust is on the team, the safer our teammates feel. So as a leader, you want to be crystal clear on these are our values. And you continually come back and talk about the values. Everything is tied to your values. That is why you do what you do. Your mission. This is what we do because of what we value. what we do because of what we value. Because we value faith, family, focus, and finish, we, we play our sport in this manner. So, uh, for that football team, they said, we're going to leave the block UA better than we found it. That means our school, we're going to leave better than we found it. That's their mission. It's not about winning football games. That's going to happen. It's about their character. It's about their behavior. That's their, that's their mission. Your vision is your idealized future. If everything goes according to plan, this is what's going to happen. Values, mission, vision. So their vision is we get a chance to play for the state championship. So by, by living these, this is a, if we behave in this way with faith, 
We treat each other as a family. We're focused. We're, we're present. If we finish, then we will leave the block UA better than we found it. And we get to pursue a state championship. We're contenders. Oh. So that is how you build a culture of accountability. You first create an environment of safety, which is the product of clarity and vulnerability. Where teammates know each other, coaches know each other, we're clear on what our values are, our mission, our vision. That level of trust allows people to engage in conflict that is healthy, which allows people to commit to the plan which then allows you to hold people accountable. When you hold people accountable, that's when you get your performance and your results. All right. What questions do you have? Yes. Things. Yes. Comfort, uh, glow, and panic. Yes. Uh, if I understand well, you say uh, our player or the people must be at the middle of our glowing. Right. Not glowing panic or uh, uh, comfort. Right. Uh, I don't know if, if he's not comfortable, mm -hmm. he can become like. Uh, don't uh, it, 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 it don't have trust of him or uh, if he's he only on the way to blowing blowing or by yeah and then sometimes uh, if uh, the panic uh, is bad but somehow sometimes it's good because makes you to be to feeling to think about what you are going to do. Okay. So, my question is: uh, how is, it, is it really to be on the middle only? Okay. The the question is: we have three zones: growth, safety, or comfort, growth, and panic. Inevitably. People are going to hit the panic zone. They're going to come back to the comfort zone, and we want then to help them process the panic. What happened? What 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 can we learn from this experience? So it's it's okay that people hit the panic zone. It's okay. It's going to happen. What we want to do is create an environment then where they can come back to us for comfort. And then we can take them into the growth zone. The comfort zone is essential because that's where people recover. You can't always be in the growth zone. You need to come back into the comfort zone, which is why we sleep every night. <laughs> so we can recharge and be ready to learn the next day. Yes. Yeah. Like he, he was, I, the way that I understood him, yeah. that maybe we want them to be always in the com in the learning. Yeah. And but he says more. I think that it's if it's like static or has like a flow. Right. So that uh, maybe to not push them so hard to be only in the learning, but to allow them to go down to comfort to be able to go back so it's not like 
right. recharging only at night, but right. having that flow. Yes. Instead of going up to panic, go down to comfort. And exactly, so exactly. So <clears throat> this one thing that uh, Coach said, a player panics on the court, you put him on the bench because he needs to calm down. That's the comfort zone. He's no longer competing. It's the comfort zone because he knows the coach, you as a coach, you're not going to blow up on him. And his players are going to come around him and support him. That's the comfort zone. You're not being punished. I'm pulling you out of the game because you need to calm down. So yes, there, this is attention to manage. When you're training your players and you're teaching them a new, a new, uh, a new play, or they're learning a new skill, they're going to fail. You know that. That failure is going to put them out on the edge of that panic zone. So you're creating a situation <clears throat> by expanding their growth zone as you approach the panic zone and keep pushing out, teaching them new skills, that that growth zone expands, that comfort zone expands, that panic zone gets smaller. This is why we continually train, 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 train. How many of you served in the military? Were any of you in the military? No. So, Sammy was. OK. Did you get scared when you were training? Yeah. Because you're running around with a rifle. And you're shooting people or shooting things. And you're throwing hand grenades. You have a bomb in your hand, and you have to throw it. Believe me, that's very scary. Right? Did you have to do that? Throw a hand grenade? Hold it next to your head? So through all that repetition, though, you learn, you gain a level of comfort with your weapon and with what, how, you, how you engage in combat. So we, we purposely put people in situations that are controlled where we know they are going to be stretched. They're going to be way out on the end of their, of their growth zone, right on that panic zone. And they may panic. And we have to be there to help them out. So the first time I ever threw a hand grenade, this is the setup. You walk into a concrete bunker. right? It's, You've got this concrete wall around you. And you've practiced with, with fake hand grenades for a week. And when you walk in, there is a sergeant standing facing you. He has two jobs. If you panic and drop the hand grenade, he's going to pick it up and throw it over the wall and knock you down. If you throw the hand grenade and you don't duck, his hand is coming down on your head as hard as he can. So they've created an environment of trust. Even Those are the safety lines when you're throwing a hand grenade. Is this what it's like for you? Yeah, same thing. So you stand there and you pull the pin and you rock back and now you have a live hand grenade next to your head and you're thinking this is stupid I want to get rid of this and you throw it and as soon as that thing goes over the wall that sergeant who's huge is crushing your head so I throw it I'm down safety oh it was a terrible throw embarrassing embarrassing throw but I was scared to death now that I've done that, okay, the next time it's not so hard. The next time it's not so hard. Okay, so it's the same thing training our athletes. 
The first time they try to execute something, it's going to be difficult. But through repetition, things go well. And we create an environment where it's OK to fail. Does that help? Good. Yeah. Uh, when there is any relationship between uh, those uh, the, the five safeties, yeah, five safeties. Yeah. In, I don't know if you have an idea on Tai Chi. Tai Chi. Tai Chi, yeah. Yeah, it's a kind of a relaxing. Right. Mind. Yeah. Things. If in Tai Chi, when you touch, like uh, the, it's look like uh, the same. Yeah. That uh, means when you touch this finger, uh -huh. is it means you become uh, physically sad. Oh yeah. I don't know if uh, it's a look like. I I honestly don't. I'm not that familiar with Tai Chi to know. Oh, in, Chad, uh, je pense que ici ils ont seulement utilisé les doigts pour pouvoir montrer certaines choses. Par exemple, on met la base à ce doigt. Oui, je comprends. Oui. Mais je, je voulais juste lui demander si ça 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 est le semblance. Non. Non. Uh, It's just like number one, two, three, four, five. Eight. Right. There's no ça n'a pas no ça n'a pas. No. Le, just uh, a symbolic. Good. Yes. Uh, create an environment uh, of vulnerability. What was that one word you had in there? Uh, I think it was safety. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is where so much of what George has taught us about our brains and how they respond neurologically, what's happening. The way we communicate verbally as well as non-verbally is essential to creating that safe environment. Are we communicating clearly about our values and the behaviors, the goals? What non-verbally, what am I communicating to my players and my coaches? So find some people that you trust, that you know well, and ask them to speak into your life. Ask an assistant coach or ask your head coach, how's my communication? Do I seem arrogant? Do I seem angry? Any other questions? You're all going to go back and build awesome teams that perform at their highest level, I'm sure. Oh, great. Well done, coach. So I like that. But at some point, it, needs to, it should also be a learning zone. Absolutely. So, in this guy's, so how do you get them? You have, you have to get them back to the comfort zone to be able to learn. Right. Okay. Right. Finding out what they need. Right. Okay. Yep. So maybe your assistant coach or the team captain or, or, or somebody on the team helps them calm down and then says, OK, what happened? Watch what's going on out here. And, and learn. See, he keeps doing this move. When he does that, you know he's going to do this. Things like that. Right. 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 That's not going to. That's not going to. So, uh, one of the Red Sox pitchers was. He was one of the one of their ace pitchers. And at the end of the season, when they got into the playoffs. Players were hitting this guy like crazy. He would pitch the ball, and it was like they knew exactly what he was going to throw. Because they knew exactly what he was going to throw. He had developed in his delivery a, a tell. He was, he, was, he was forecasting his next pitch. And a friend of the coach, who was a pitcher, was watching the game. And he called him up. And he said, hey, your guy's telegraphing his pitch. 
He's letting everybody know when he's going to throw a breaking ball and when he's going to throw a fastball. Meanwhile, this guy is he's just crumbling because he's getting hit all over the place. He doesn't trust himself, and now his teammates are kind of wondering, is this guy, does he have his stuff? <clears throat> so by kind of pulling him out of competition, putting him in the in the uh, in the in a pitcher's box and practicing, they were able to get him to correct his form and they won the World Series. So good good stuff. All right. Anything else? Ruth, you sitting on attack, you okay? Good. All right. All right. Very good. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Have a great day.